I'd now like to extend a warm welcome to our ration guest speaker, Associate Professor Marty Townsend, known to many of you in the room, I'm sure. Marty teaches in the School of Health and Social Development in Deakin University's Faculty of Health. Throughout her career, she's adopted a partnership approach to her work, collaborating extensively across research and policy, across national, state and local governments, non-government organisations and industry groups. She's currently collaborating with a range of organisations, including Parks Victoria, G21, the Austin Hospital Group and the City of Melbourne. And I'm pleased to say that many of those stakeholders are in the room with us this evening. And we're delighted to welcome you here. Marty's research interests include the human health benefits of interaction with nature, urban and rural contexts for health and wellbeing, social and health impact assessment, and housing and homelessness. The 2012 Peter Coyle orations titled Green Spaces and Wellbeing, Social, Con Social Inclusion via Nature Connections. And I'd like you to join me now in welcoming Marty. Thanks very much, Kay, for that welcome, and thank you to the Alliance for the invitation to speak. I want to especially thank the Deakin Department of Health, Department of Human Services Strategic Alliance for their organisation and sponsorship of this event. I'd also like to acknowledge the colleagues with whom I have worked on the various projects that I'm talking about tonight, especially Matt Ebden, who is here with us, uh, Liz O'Brien from Forestry UK, Jonathan Yotti Kingsley from Vic Health Now, and Claire Henderson Wilson, one of my work colleagues at the School of Health and Social Development. I'd also like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting and to their elders past and present. But perhaps even more importantly for this, this occasion, I'd like to pay my respects to the family of the late Peter Quayle. I do not have the privilege of knowing Peter, if I may take the liberty of calling him by first name, and I know that that is my loss. From what I've, <coughs> excuse me, from what I've learned about Peter, he was passionate about social justice, and particularly about improving for vulnerable people their access to quality services. I trust that what I have to say today may in some small way contribute to improved social inclusion for vulnerable people and may therefore honour Peter appropriately. These two statements about wellbeing, the one on the left from the Australian Bureau of Statistics and the second from Brian Furness, share a common view that a key factor in our wellbeing is nature or the natural environment. There are two key ways in which the environment affects human health through its quality and through its accessibility. When the World Health Organization states that more than 25% of the world's disease is attributable to environmental factors, it is referring to the quality of the environment in which people live or more particularly to environmental degradation. For example, air pollution is responsible for approximately 3.3 million deaths per year globally, and 1.1 billion people worldwide live without access to clean water. But there is another aspect of the environment that is important for human health, its accessibility. Increasingly, it is being recognised that human health is undermined when we are deprived of nature contact, when we have no green spaces to enjoy, no pets or gardens to nurture. You've all seen images like this before, the very obvious effects of environmental degradation but the effects of environmental deprivation are less graphic. John Muir, the founder of the Sierra Club, the largest so-called grassroots environmental organisation in the United States, was a man who was ahead of his time when he said this, everybody needs beauty as well as bread, places to play in and pray in, where nature may heal and cheer and give strength to body and soul alike. 
You might be forgiven for thinking that in bringing this quote to your attention, I'm simply drawing attention to the threat posed to our access to green spaces by urban densification and urban sprawl. Certainly, over recent years, as we have become a more urbanised and less religious society, the need for such places has become more acute. But in fact, in drawing attention to this quote, I am highlighting an even more important issue, the inherent need within all humans, the healthy and the unhealthy, the rich and the poor, the secure and the vulnerable for contact with nature. Humans are physiologically dependent on nature. We always have been. In modern times, we like to think that it's not true, that our sophistication and our technological development have taken us beyond that dependence. We only need, though, to look at tsunamis, earthquakes, fires and the like to realise how dependent we are on the goodness of nature. But we are also psychologically dependent on nature. A famous Harvard biologist, Edward Wilson, observing the human tendency to crave contact with nature, developed an explanation for it, which he called the biophilia hypothesis. Basically, his thesis was that humans have lived in close contact with other species throughout human existence. And it is only really in the last 250 years that we have become separated from nature. Wilson reasoned that this change has occurred too quickly for us to have evolved to adapt to the change. Wilson's argument that humans continue to crave contact with nature seems to be well supported anecdotally. 64% of Australian households have a pet. We give flowers for every occasion. And figures from the, the Australian Garden Market Monitor show that in the six months to the 31st of December 2006, Australians spent over $3 billion on garden-related items and services. An astonishing figure. <clears throat> There is a growing body, too, of empirical evidence to support Wilson's hypothesis. For example, a Dutch study of 17,000 patients from more than 100 GP practices found positive physical and mental health effects and increased physical activity associated with higher levels of proximal nature. This was true in children under 16 housewives, people from low SES areas, and those under 65 in particular. Another Dutch study of the medical records of more than 340,000 people showed a lower prevalence of 15 out of 24 diseases among participants living within one kilometre of green spaces. In Canada, a study conducted in Toronto in 2009 found that participants reported neighbourhood green space was an important factor contributing to their positive mental health. And in an Australian study, Sugiyama and colleagues examined the links between perceived neighbourhood greenness and self-rated physical and mental health. They found that people who perceived their neighbourhoods as very green had a 1.37 to 1.6 times greater likelihood of better physical and mental health, respectively, when compared with those who perceived their neighbourhoods as lower in greenness. So greenness is important for health. Let's turn now to the social determinants of health. Like environmental degradation, the social determinants of health are widely recognised. As Wilkinson and Marmot put it, life is short where its quality is poor. By causing hardship and resentment, 
poverty, social exclusion and discrimination cost lives. It's important to define a couple of terms here. The first is poverty. When we talk about poverty, we think about it in absolute terms, how much money people have. But much more important than absolute poverty is relative deprivation or relative poverty, which is bad for health, that is being poorer than most people in society. The second is social exclusion, being excluded from access to the structures and resources of society based on racism, discrimination, stigmatisation, hostility and unemployment. Our health statistics paint a grim picture of the impacts of social exclusion. And here are some, here's some of the evidence. Indigenous people are less healthy, die at much younger ages, have more disability and a lower quality of life. Economically disadvantaged Australians are more likely to have shorter lives. People with disability are more likely to have poor physical and mental health and higher rates of smoking and overweight. And refugees also experience health disadvantage. All of that from the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. It is an amusing image, is it not? But it is also telling. It highlights the coming together of both the accessibility and quality of natural environments. And which sector of the population is most likely to be denied access to good quality environments? Those who are socially excluded, the poor, those with a disability, the indigenous, the refugees, those with mental health problems. Some years ago, I worked in public housing in the UK and vividly remember visiting a public housing estate on the Isle of Wight, where there were cramped backyards in contrast to large swathes of green space outside the individual properties. Wonderful, you say. Lots of neighbourhood greenness. Yes, but that green was covered with signs saying, please keep off the grass and no ball games. The people living in those council houses, the children especially, had few other options for accessing green space and they were being denied what they needed for good health. <coughs> Trevor Hancock, a leading health promotion expert from Canada, suggests that three broad elements, the economic environment, the social or community environment and the natural and built environment must all come together in positive ways if human health is to be optimised. Basically, the physical environment needs to be viable for human existence in its range of temperatures, for example. It needs to be sustainable in the long term and the built environment needs to be livable, such as having adequate green spaces. The economic environment needs to be adequately prosperous on an environmentally and socially sustainable basis, with the benefits of this prosperity distributed equitably. The social environment or community needs to be convivial that is to have appropriate support networks and to foster harmony and participation in community life. It needs to be livable, to support conviviality and provide a viable human living environment. And it needs to be equitable, characterised by fairness and justice. According to Hancock, it is only when all three domains meet the required characteristics 
that human health is optimised. So what happens when this isn't the case? Some of you may remember Marvin Gaye. This park in Washington DC is named after him because he first performed in a nightclub directly opposite the park. I was taken to Marvin Gaye Park by Steve Coleman, the CEO of an organisation, not-for-profit not organisation called Washington Parks and People. Steve lived and still lives in a suburb of Washington DC called Adams Morgan. If you've been to DC, you'll know that it's quite a nice upmarket place to stay these days, but it wasn't when Steve first moved there. And on one occasion, he walked out his front door to see a 16-year-old boy from next door gunned down in a drive-by shooting, killed. He and four others of his neighbours decided that that was it, it was time to take action. And so they formed a, a vigilante group, if you like. They donned orange coats and hats and they walked the streets and parks of that area to try and make it safer for those who lived in the area. The local park was Meridian Hill Park, what is now a lovely area to visit. But at the time it was the scene of drug dealing and, and violence, crime and the like. Steve and his friends would walk through the park at night and greet everybody, no matter what they were doing, politely. Hello, lovely evening, isn't it? And of course, drug dealers and people who are up to no good don't really want to be greeted like that. So very quickly, they moved out. Washington Parks and People has become a fantastic organisation that has spread its work way beyond the Meridian Hill area, including this area surrounding Marvin Gay Park. Marvin Gay Park once used to be a place of community, of pride and of leisure. It was the centre of life in the local area. But decades of abandonment made it one of Washington DC's worst, worst parks, not unlike low socioeconomic status areas in many cities. Drug dealing and violence compounded the neglect and environmental degradation to make it a place where children could no longer play and families no longer wanted to go. Steve decided he would begin by consulting the children in the local area as to what they might like in the park. They replied that they would like a farmer's market. So Steve dutifully went off to the local council and asked if he could set up a farmer's market. Oh, no, 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 they said. We can't have people selling things in parks. And he said, well, they've been selling speed and heroin here for years. Would you mind if we sold peas and potatoes instead? And so the children got their farmer's market. Washington Parks and People worked with the local community which had been socially and environmentally deprived to achieve great things. Here are some of the achievements. Let me highlight just one of these. You can read these as I'm talking. Steve received some funding to employ staff to work on Marvin Gay Park. He employed Kenny You'll see a photo of Kenny shortly. Kenny is a local. He has lived all his life in the area, that is, apart from the time he spent in prison. He came to work with Steve through a job training scheme and is now a key people in the development, uh, uh, sorry, a key person in the development, maintenance and monitoring of the park and the surrounding area. Kenny now has an assistant another person who came through the same job training scheme. But there are also other jobs opening up in the area. 
Now that the park can be used for recreational purposes, there are opportunities for ice cream vendors, soft drink sellers and the like. And with the broad community renewal that has been leveraged from the, the work of Washington Parks and People, construction jobs have also opened up for the locals. It is a ripple effect. What began with the response of four or five people to a drive-by shooting at Meridian Hill has now transformed whole areas of Washington, D.C. The results, of course, are obvious. This is the old nightclub, which has been renovated as a community hub. In winter, the farmer's market is held indoors because it's too cold in the park. But the venue also has rooms for youth activities, a soup kitchen, and the potential for community education. This is Kenny. I'd stake a lot on the fact that he will never go back to prison. He has a permanent job. But more than that, he has respect and he has new opportunities. When Washington Parks and People wanted some research done and asked for my advice, I suggested that Kenny would be the ideal person to talk to the locals about their views. So Kenny, the job scheme member, is now Kenny, the manager, and also Kenny, the researcher. In the area adjacent to the park, there has been a huge community renewal project. New housing, a new school being built, improved streets and the like. The park is now an attractive area and the restored nightclub building is a draw card for tourists interested in the history of popular music. But it is not just renewal of buildings that the park has triggered. It has also contributed to enhanced cultural understanding, community revitalisation, crime prevention, civic empowerment, child development and improved social connections. While I was there, I met with a wonderful African-American elderly lady who runs from her own home a support program for young single mothers. She teaches them about cooking healthy meals, about parenting, and she even provides an opportunity shop for them to buy or swap clothes for themselves and their children. All this arose from the original Washington Parks and People initiative. Another woman in her 60s was showing Steve and me around another class another park, Watts Branch, quite close by, when we detected pollution in the stream flowing through the park. In the, par in the past, there would have been no one to take action on this. Once Steve became involved, he might have taken action. But now the action comes from the local people. Within minutes, this lady was on the mobile phone to the Environmental Monitoring Agency demanding that they come at once and take action to stop the pollution. It is an example of Trevor Hancock's model in action. What about here in Australia and much closer to home? In 2006, Matt Ebden and I undertook a project entitled Feel Blue Touch Green. The title says it all, really. It's based on the notion that when we feel distressed or depressed, contact with nature can provide relief. How often when you go home stressed from work do you tell the dog all about the bastards who've been bugging you? Or do you, when you get frustrated, Get out into the garden and dig as though your life depended on it. This project involved taking a group of people who were suffering from anxiety and depression out into a park to work with members of a Friends of Park group in planting, weeding, plant propagation and the like. By connecting the people into the group, we hope that their connection with that environment would be more sustainable, since they would have friends there. 
The project was evaluated to assess the benefits for the participants in terms of their health and well-being. It was a pilot study, a very small study with 10 participants. And it was based on a single case design, that is, the participants before and after was how we controlled for other variables. They undertook 10 or more hours of a range of nature-based activities over a period of six to 12 weeks. And those activities were supported by the Angair volunteers, the Anglesey and Aries Inlet Society for the Preservation of Nature, <laughs> I think. <laughs> Something like that. Um, evaluation was using a range of scales plus in-depth interviews. What did we find? Well, in using the emotional state scale, where people could mark on a continuum from 0 to 10, what they were feeling in terms of interest level, happiness, confidence, and a range of other variables, we could measure the impacts of each activity because this was done before and after. What we found was that the emotional state scale indicated improved positive emotional change in all participants. But the interviews were even more interesting. People talked about building social connections. Here are some of the quotes from the people that were interviewed. This, feel blue, touch green, is good for people who may not have the courage to get involved. People were accepting and this broke down the stigma of mental illness. It's been good to be with each other, they said. Others talked about skill development, being willing to take risks and confront challenges. One person said, I developed new skills and acquired knowledge in plant propagation and in identifying noxious weeds. <coughs> and another commented that he had been able to participate even when not well. Others reflected on the benefits for their mental health, their confidence and their sense of self-worth. By taking part in Feel Blue Touch Green, I've experienced happiness that I would otherwise have missed out on. I developed confidence in this supportive environment. They, referring to the project partners, Parks Victoria, Alcoa, um, and People in Parks Foundation, uh, offered gentle encouragement and were supportive. And they talked about being able to manage depression and their depressed mood. Being involved in Feel Blue Touch Green helps me to manage depression. We all know what that feels like. Get out there into the natural environment, you feel better. In 2007, I collaborated with Dr Liz O'Brien from Forestry UK on a study of environmental volunteering. And again, I roped Matt into coming over with me and helping collect the data and analyse it. Though it was not the rationale for the research, it became apparent during the study that environmental volunteering is a very effective me method or mechanism for social inclusion. Within the groups we studied were people from low socioeconomic backgrounds, young people who had been on the wrong side of the law, and people with developmental delays or disabilities. <clears throat> the purpose of the study was to understand the motivations, barriers and benefits of vol volunteering in woodlands and green spaces in the UK. The study was conducted in the north of England and the south of Scotland, and uh, I think someone was on our side because we were there for two weeks and didn't get wet once. It involved 88 volunteers across 10 different organisations and data was collected via scales and indices and through interviews. One of the most interesting findings was this. This was the, the measurement of the emotional state scale 
And uh, you probably can't read the small writing there, but the only, only parameter on which the results were worse after the activity than they were before was pain. And they actually thought that was terrific because if they were in pain, it meant they must have done something really energetic and worthwhile, and so they were happy about it. This is a picture taken from one of the uh, days that we spent out in the natural environment. This is a group that was working on a project called Project Scotland. It involved young offenders and older people with mental health issues in working with Forestry UK, Forestry Scotland, in dealing with uh, drainage issues, uh, noxious weed removal and the like in the west of Scotland, just out of air. It provided skills training, work experience, social interaction and the possibility of employment at the end. Many of the participants had been on a one-way trip to nowhere and had spent much of their time involved in drinking, drug abuse and petty crime. This program turned them around. And some of them talked to us, young men talked to us about setting up their own business. They talked to us about the fact that their families were now proud of them instead of being ashamed of them. It was miraculous. This photo was taken during the same study, but this is in the Lakes Dis Lake District National Park. <coughs> we spent a day in the Lake District um, and there were four groups involved in volunteering, all in the same activity on the same day. People came from the Environment Agency, which was a government department, and they were using one of their two annual days that they could donate to charity. So they could use two days of their working year to work for an organisation, a charitable purpose. And this group of people, about eight of them, had chosen to work on the environment. There were also people from the Lake District National Park Volunteers Group, group uh, people from Friends of the Lake District, and a group of people from an organisation called West House, which is a facility locally for people with developmental delays and disabilities. They worked together for the day and we worked with them for the morning and then spent the afternoon interviewing them. And when we interviewed the, the lady who had led the group from West House, we asked her what it was like for her people to be involved. She said, wonderful. And do you know why, she said. It's fantastic for them because they're doing exactly the same as everybody else and they can. Environmental volunteering is inclusive. It enables people, even with developmental delays, to use the skills they have and to feel good about themselves. The final example I want to give you is about nature connections for Indigenous wellbeing. This project was completed by Jonathan Yotti Kingsley in 2005 6 he interviewed members of the Yorta Yorta, Bangarang and Boonawurrung Indigenous peoples to explore their views on the implications for their health and well-being of being involved in caring for country. What he found was a range of benefits, in some ways very similar to the benefits provided by the Washington DC example. We all know how important self-respect, empowerment and opportunity are for us and for our own well-being. And how much more so for a people who have collectively been marginalised and disadvantaged for centuries. And yet we still permit, ignore, perhaps even encourage policies and practices 
which diminish people's access to green spaces. We've read in the papers recently of further threats to the green wedges on Melbourne's fringe from development. And I know about the redevelopment of Shannon Park, a facility for people with significant disabilities, which has resulted in that site now only have, having one grassed area and that being a sloping site. These are people in wheelchairs, for goodness sake. What are we thinking about in the way we develop? But there are, there are some green shoots. There are some positive examples of good things happening. The Active in Parks program in the Barwon region. Parks Victoria, G21, the Department of Health, the Department of uh, Community, uh, the Department of Planning and Community Development, the People and Parks Foundation, and Medibank Private are partners in this program. Jackie DeKevitt, the uh, Executive Officer of the People and Parks Foundation, here is here, and Elaine Carbines from G21, and I'm sure they'd be very happy to talk to you about this in detail later. It's a program that works with health and community agencies to embed within their everyday practices and programs access to green spaces and all the benefits that access can bring. Groups like Diversitat, the Migrant Resource Centre, and Pathways, which works with people with serious mental illness, are involved. And the People and Parks Foundation has just recently re uh, received confirmation of funding for another two years for this program. It is now looking to replicate this work by encouraging the new Medicare locals to see parks as a key part of their preventive health programs, not just in the Barwon region, but across the state. On a much smaller scale, uh, Think about the Health, Nature and Sustainability Research Group at Deakin, which I lead. We're in the process of redeveloping our website. Keep an eye out for it, and when you see it, you'll find lots of interesting research that's happening there and possibilities of partnerships. At Deakin as well, within the School of Health and Social Development, we are developing a new major sequence to be part of the Bachelor of Health Sciences on health and sustainability. That's currently going through the processes of Deakin's approval, but we anticipate that that will be on board for 2013. And finally, there is growing interest emerging in nature health connections from a range of areas. Local government, I recently had a call from somebody from Gosford Council asking if we could be involved in some research. In academia, this area has become accepted. When I started at Deakin 17 years ago, they all thought I was a bit of a lunatic. What on earth is she talking about the environment for? Now they really get it. In the health sector, clearly they get it, or I wouldn't be standing up here today. And in the local communities, people clearly get it. In fact, they got it way before I did. John Muir again. What an amazing man he was. I only went out for a walk and finally concluded to stay out till sundown, for going out, I found, was really going in. In the context of our topic today, social inclusion, one might say going out is a way of enabling those on the outer to come in. Thank you. Now, we've got plenty of time for questions, and we've got a roving mic as well. I would just ask if you could please um, <coughs> state your name and the organisation you represent ahead of your question. 
Has anyone got a question for Marty? I wanted to ask a more um, general question about green spaces. I was interested in, um, in a lot of the talk about the importance of accessibility to green spaces, but I'm interested in the question of quality, particularly with regard to children's development. Mm -hmm. Is there equal weight in living a block away from, say, our local football oval to, I guess, wild spaces or more interactive play spaces that are outdoors for children? And, and how do you value the different types of green space? There are, um, there are important differences and we need uh, football ovals and the like to encourage physical activity. We certainly need those. But in terms of children's cognitive development, the availability of more natural green spaces within local communities is significant. So if children get out there into natural green spaces, their inquiring minds will prompt them to ask questions and they will learn problem solving skills and they will develop, their cognitive abilities will develop much more in those sorts of spaces than in football oval or that, those sort of sporting ovals. However, we need to recognise we need both. My, my strong feeling is that every local area needs small playgrounds, large open spaces on which people can play sport, throw frisbees, run and the like, as well as some natural or restored green space that is um, an area where children will see the bugs and the birds and the bees around. If we have all three of those types of open space in every area, it will be optimal for children's development. Great, thank you. We've got a comment or question over here. Yeah, this is a question. Uh, you had the information up there going back quite a while talking about changes in um, society. You were saying um, uh, living closely with um, animals and um, the environment, things like that. And you said something about 250, since the last 250 years ago, and I didn't right. know the background. What changed socially that people, what was the big change 250 years ago that we can look and learn from? Well, 250 years ago, we began living in urban environments. The Industrial Revolution was the key there, where people moved from uh, an agrarian society into large cities. Um, and if you, uh, you will have seen photos of the uh, industrial Britain um, with the smog-bound cities and uh, houses built one on top of one another, the sewerage running down the streets and the like, it was an absolute disaster. But even where cities are clean, what has happened is people have become separated from their dependence on nature. We go to the shop. You know, you ask children, where does milk come from? They say the supermarket. They don't understand that milk actually comes from cows. And uh, I've been involved over recent years with the evaluation of the Stephanie Alexander Kitchen Garden Foundation program in primary schools. And one of the things that's been achieved through that program is raising the awareness of children about where food comes from and what's entailed in growing food. There was a very funny story in our evaluation that, that uh, an interview with one of the parents said that in, in a small rural school in, in northwest Victoria where the mother came home and found the child ratting around in the pantry and said, what are you looking for? And the child said, I'm looking for the turmeric. And the mother said, what's turmeric? <laughs> and what's happened through this program is that the children have been taught to use seasonal vegetables and then use herbs and spices to make them attractive and interesting dishes. And so they have a whole new outlook on what eating is. It's no longer fish fingers or a maccas or something. They're actually into creating meals for themselves. A wonderful education. Hello, my name's Andrew Crowley. I'm new to Deakin uh, in the sport and recreation area in student life. Yes. And one of the things that strikes me about the university, you've got wonderful social capital here with all these students. And I'm wondering if there's any examples of uh, any research or any connections with, with students into their community uh, on large scales from a student perspective too for their health as well-being. 
uh, into the natural environment, you mean? Yeah, and working with wow. community groups around those sorts of things. Right, okay. And the natural environment. Um, we have had students who have done volunteer tree planting, um, particularly, I, I'm aware of this, particularly around the Burwood campus in the Gardner's Creek area. Um, but uh, interestingly, some colleagues and I are just in the process of d developing a large research grant um, to put into the Australian Research Council where we're looking at engaging students from Deakin with the natural environment and measuring the impacts of that. So, maybe. Uh, hello, I'm, my name's Ben. I'm just a member of the community as well. Um, you touched on Stephanie Alexander's program, which we'll understand is wonderful. It seems, I've moved down to Geelong about five years ago and there seems to be a disproportionate amount of funding that goes to sport. I mean, it's all about sport down here in Cart. Now you mentioned the spaces, the, what we should be using them for and I was wondering what you thought about having a display of an actual community garden, not just 20 members who go down each week to the Geelong West Community Garden, but actually having a place which is more because people just don't have a connect with their food anymore. Yeah. And I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that. Look, I, think, uh, I think the idea of engaging the community in community gardens is fantastic. I've had a number of students who've done studies of the benefits of community gardens, and they are enormous, especially um, not only for people who have no garden space themselves, because they are a social networking opportunity as well as the opportunity to grow food. Uh, but especially as our cities become more densely populated, uh, as we cut off our backyards and have no room to grow vegetables, um, the opportunity to engage in community gardening is really important. And I think it would be a fantastic idea to, um, to have some displays about community gardens and the opportunities for them and to have the council promoting this. And I know that the council does this. I know that the council has supported several of the gardens that my students have studied. But to have this really promoted would be fantastic um, because I think that many people are not aware even of the notion of a community garden. It, it, it harks back to the days of Europe and Britain particularly where the allotment gardening took place particularly around the war. Um, but nowadays it has other purposes but it's got tremendous benefits and I'd be very supportive of that. Hi, I'm Mary Lou Chatterton. Uh, I'm new to Deakin Health Economics and I'm curious if anybody has attempted to quantify the economic benefit of all these programs that you're talking about. Um, in a very basic, crude way of saying what health costs are avoided. Um, I'd be very keen to work with the Deakin Health Economics team to look at how this can be done. So uh, talk to me. <laughs> we, we do know that it's actually you know, in avoided health care costs, if you simply look at reduced mental health problems, increased physical activity, um, $1.5 billion a year um, is incurred annually in Australia due to physical inactivity. Uh, that's Medibank Private's figures. And so we know that to, to have people being more active is actually saving a huge amount of money. I'm Selma from Play Australia. Um, so my question was just about nature play spaces in schools. Mm -hmm. um, just putting more nature play spaces in schools, but also making educators, especially primary schools, more aware of the benefits of nature. Um, your awareness of this and what yes. you think about that, please. Yes, uh, very supportive of that. Um, I had a PhD student, uh, Cecily Maller, who did her PhD on hands-on environmental programs in primary schools, and much of this was informal programs but some of it was to do with informal interaction with nature in the schoolyard where they had natural corners, uh, nature corners. <clears throat> and what she found was enormous benefits not just for children's cognitive development but for their capacity to relate across the generations and for their problem solving skills. So I, I think it's a terrific idea. Um, 
In inner city schools, uh, one of the problems is often space. In the primary school where our children went, um, in Melbourne, relatively small uh, yard space, um, very little greenness, and uh, you know to get that put in there would be ideal, but difficult. But I, I couldn't agree more. I think it's really important. Um, I don't know if you've read the National Tree Day report. Um, I wrote the co-forward co for that, um, and you know that report highlights the the desperate lack of contact with nature that many of our Australian children have. You know, many children couldn't identify a wattle or a bottle brush, uh, had never been out into a natural bushland space. So I think given that that is the case and many children spend so much time in front of a screen, to have a wild nature area in every school would be an ideal way to, to help balance the ledger, if you like. Uh, my name's Terry Brooks. I'm here because I was a very close friend of Peter Quayle's. Uh, the London School of Economics has done a lot of work on the indices of happiness. Mm -hmm. And they certainly covered areas of social inclusion, social capital, and established, if you like, also a minimum level of income beyond which it really yes. didn't matter yes. how much money you had. Yes. And they also covered that issue that one of the greatest dissatisfactions people have is a feeling that they're not doing as well as the people around them. Yes. But they were almost, they were silent as far as I can see on the issue of open space and mm. Mm. contact with nature. Mm. Um, does your work cross over with the research that they've done? Um, I'm not familiar with them particular, their work in particular. Um, and I would say that one of the reasons why they, they didn't touch on that green space was that this is a really relatively new uh, area of work. Um, Professor Howard Frumpkin, who is now the Dean of Health at Washington State University, was one of the key people writing in this area. Um, Rachel and Stephen Kaplan for the, from the University of Michigan. But it's only recently, particularly in the UK, that it's being picked up. Um, and certainly, uh, as I would say, Trevor Hancock's model suggests, and I am keen that we look at all three of those intersecting circles, the community, the economics, and the environment, and I think that that's the only way to go. But I, I can't say that I'm familiar with that work, but I will certainly go away and look it up. Thank you for the hint. <laughs> This is very quick. Um, just to, um, I'm a teacher. My name is Astra. Um, I was just wondering, the study that you did in the UK um, with respect to the volunteers in the um, forests, mm -hmm. is that available or um, do we, is, will there be a link of, um, so that you can look at it? Uh, when we have our new website up, which we hope will be within a matter of weeks, there will be a link to that report and you'll be able to access it. But if, if you can't do that, um, Contact me by email and I'll happily send you a copy. Um, just a comment, I live in Geelong West too, an inner suburb, and I've lived there for about 20 years. And, um, you know, one of the advantages of living there, you can walk. Um, and part of the pleasure of living there is that you can walk through um, green spaces, public green spaces, even though they might be limited. And what I've noticed in uh, along Packerton Street at the back where I go. Um, for example, where used to be the Geelong West Old Council um, building, they sold it off. But what I didn't realise is that they all also sold off that green patch next to the building. So even though now you can walk through it, I believe it <coughs> was um, given to um, gateways and I believe they intend on putting a building there. Also, when um, um, they put the new library there, you can see there's less green space as well. I'm just saying this is done slowly, but in that area, little by little, the green public space, I'm not talking about the community garden or parks, the actual public limited open space is becoming less and less. 
I uh, can't comment on the area because I'm not familiar with it. Um, I would say that it's true in most cities that um, there is an increased density of housing, that spaces that were previously public spaces are often being sold off for housing. Now, there's, there, are, there are good environmental reasons why we need to increase the density of housing within cities rather than sprawl beyond. It is a balancing act always, and I don't envy those in charge how they make, how they get the balance right. Um, I think that all I do is keep heightening their awareness of the importance of green space and uh, work with them to see how they can optimise that. Thank you. We've got two more questions, one here and one over there, and then that's all we have time for today. Thank you. Um, I lived in Geelong for many years, but have uh, recently moved to Melbourne and live in an apartment in Flinders Lane. So um, it's it's quite a, a difference um, being near Eastern Beach and the East uh, Geelong yes. Gardens. Prior to that, um, I have a small dog, and I take my dog daily, as we have to in apartments, for yes. walks morning and evening. And um, there's a, a small park along the river near, near me, so I, I take him around there. And I've met a wonderful uh, friendship group um, yes. due to the dog yes. um, it, that congregate from yes. various apartment buildings within the city there and um, from all cultures and yes. they are so happy to meet each other via the dogs and we, we go and now uh, we have dinner together and drinks together yes. and, <laughs> and all the rest with our dogs. Yes. And um, I'm just wondering if you've done studies into the, because the people that I meet are just so happy. We all have this common, started with this common theme of our pet mm -hmm. and that has now been able to, as I said, and some of the people can't speak much English. Mm -hmm. um, that has provided the inclusiveness, if you like, to our group and they're always happy to, we're always really happy when we run into each other, etc. Yes. So I wondered if there'd been any studies in regard to not only the environment, that actual park space, but also to the animals in our environment yes. and the way that, um, like, some of these people, as I said, they can hardly speak any English, but um, they've met us due to the dog and, and have felt included. And um, I, I just uh, think that maybe they wouldn't have met so many people or been involved maybe in such a lovely friendship group without the dog, yes. if you like. Okay. The short answer to your question is yes, there has been research done on pets um, and their benefits for health. And, and my own experience as the, the owner of two dogs is that I've met and w made friends with local people uh, whom I would never have known otherwise. I always say that, you know, when you walk through a park with a dog or two, um, everyone says, hello, nice day, isn't it? And if I walked down the street in Bentley near where I live and started saying willy-nilly hello to people, they'd call the ambulance or the cat team and I'd be in the Alfred Sark unit, wouldn't I? Um, but <coughs> dogs are a lubricant for social interaction across a range of divides. Um, I had a student one year who did an honours degree study of taking animals into an aged care facility. And she used uh, animals from the Lord Smith Animal Hospital were brought every week and they would be taken and the people would sit around and pat the rabbits and guinea pigs and cats and dogs and so forth. And there was one particular lady who was relatively new to the facility who refused to come out of her room, who felt that her family had dumped her in the aged care facility and she was very angry. And Lauren made an effort to make sure every week that she would take one or two of the animals and go and visit this lady in her room. And after three weeks, the lady came out and joined in the group because she didn't want to miss out on seeing all the animals. And that broke that, the ice for her and she became integrated then into that aged care facility community. So I think that it's absolutely true, and the evidence base from empirical research will show you that pets relieve stress and promote social connections. 
On behalf of everyone here tonight and the Deakin Department of Health, Department of Human Services Strategic Alliance, I'd like to thank Marty for a really insightful presentation. You've walked us through a framework of the evidence base followed by the determinants of health, Trevor Hancock's model of health, and then we've moved into some really practical examples where you've brought this alive for us, the examples in Washington, in the UK, and then you've brought it back home and given some very practical local examples. I, I'm very excited to look at the green shoots and how they develop over time, and I'm hoping that we'll see more green shoots as a result of this presentation. I'd like you to join me in now thanking Marty and the traditional <laughs>